Welcome to the Christian Men at Work podcast, where I interview men from all walks of life with varying job titles who have one thing in common. They are all choosing daily to live out their Christian faith through their work, and because of that, they are leading, prospering, glorifying God, and experiencing joy and purpose in their work, and you can too. Men at Work, it's so great to be with you. Welcome to episode number 15. And before we get on to the interview, I wanted to say a few things. Uh, First of all, it's been nine months since uh, the last episode. That uh, is quite a long time, longer than I thought it would be. I stepped away from doing the podcast um, for several reasons. Um, I wanted to make sure that this was something that I really should be doing, that God wanted me to do. And I wanted to make sure that I could do it in a way where it uh, fit in with the other priorities in my life. And um, so I've been taking the time to kind of uh, pray and think about those things. And uh, I've uh, come to the conclusion that it is something I should be doing, and I'm really excited about starting it back up. Um, and there are some really awesome interviews ahead that uh, I'm going to be sharing with you over the next uh, couple months as as we get back into it. I do intend to do it every uh, publish an episode every two weeks, which is the schedule that I was on before. And um, we'll kind of see how that goes for a while before deciding whether um, to change that frequency. But that's that's the plan right now. I wanted to introduce. Uh, a, I, I'm calling her a sponsor. I mean, I'm not planning on doing a bunch of advertising on this uh, episode, but I wanted to recognize uh, someone who has done. Uh, help me out by doing um, artwork for the social media channels and the websites that I've had. And she does a great job, and I just wanted you to encourage her to check her out if you need help in those areas. And her name is Dorothy Smith, and her website is um, dbootonsmith.weebly.com, and that is d-b-o-u-t-o-n-s-m-i-t-h dot w-e-e-b-l-y Dot com. The next thing I wanted to just say a few things about were the changes to the format for the show. Um, not a whole lot of big changes. Um, the format is still pretty much me interviewing everyday guys uh, who have all different occupations, talking about living out their faith through their work. I um, changed the name from Spirit Led Men at Work to Christian Men at Work. Uh, the main reason was just it seemed like a little more obvious what it was about to maybe more people who come from different de- denominations. Um, I just thought it was a little more more intuitive, a uh, simpler name, you might say. Um, the other thing is that we're adding a prayer line to the podcast. And I want to give credit to Brian Harden at dailyaudiobible.com. That's really where I got inspired to do this. They have a phone number on that podcast where people can call in and uh, have prayer requests and and make comments. And I really feel like it creates a really cool community on that podcast. And I'm hoping it will do the same for this. Uh, So here's the number. If you have a pen and paper to write it down, it's 641 715 3900 extension 524645 pound. I apologize, that's a little bit of a lengthy number, but um, let me tell it to you one more time and then I'll give it again at the end of the episode. It's 641 715 3900, and then once it answers, you dial an extension 524645 pound. A couple more changes I wanted to just point out. One is that I am still blogging. Uh, I'm no longer using the name spiritledmen.com. I decided to go back to using just my name, davehilgendorf.com. And so I've got links there to my blog as well as to information on this podcast and the, the book that I wrote, Jesus is at Work. And I wanted to uh, encourage you to check out a free video series that I created on my YouTube channel 
for the book Jesus is at Work. Basically, I, I do a short video summarizing all 14 chapters of the book. So if you're not sure if you want to get the book or if you just want to watch the videos instead, um, it's it's a, a good way to consume that information um, uh, from that book, which is all about having joy and purpose at your work. Let me tell you a little bit about our interview today. We're going to uh, have a real treat. We're going to be talking with Chuck Powers. Chuck's a, a good friend of mine. I've known for um, several years. He was born in 1955 in West Virginia, was brought up in a Catholic home, attended Catholic <clears throat> grade school, and was senior class president at his high school. He was all-conference basketball in 1970, an All-American Youth Bowling Champion, and Collegiate Bowler of the Year in 1975. He has managed her own bowling center since 1974, and he currently oversees and does promotional work for two bowling centers in North Carolina. So Chuck is a big bowler. Uh, he's uh, lived in Asheboro since 1993. He's been married to Cindy for 37 years now, and they have two children and two grandchildren. And he oversees two ministries that he started, which is uh, the bulk of what we're going to talk about in the interview. The first one is Randolph Christian Men, that uh, is really how I met Chuck, and that's been um, overseen since 2008. And then Freedom Brothers Prison Ministry since 2014. Let's get right to the interview. Chuck, thanks for joining the uh, interview today. I appreciate it. And I wanted to start out by just asking you a real simple question. When and how did you become a Christian? Oh, gosh, Dave. Uh, my mother was a devout Catholic. Uh, my dad was what I was told was like an old country Methodist boy. But we grew up Catholic. My dad, when I was a child, he went to the Catholic Church. And my sister and I were in Catholic school. Uh, I loved the church, and I had a love of God, but I didn't know really much anything about Jesus, although there was a statue in the church of Jesus and a statue of Mary. Uh, I was in church every day for several years. I, I was an altar boy, and I could walk to church, so I was the kid who... Who, it was called Mass, so I would go over at 6 a.m. before school, and I would help the priest with the 6 a.m. Mass. So I spent almost every day in church from the time I was um, probably eight or nine until the eighth grade. And in the eighth grade, I trained the younger boys as altar boys. Now... My best friend lived two doors from me, and my best friend's dad was a pastor, but I hardly ever saw him. I didn't know him that well, but I knew his mother and grandmother extremely well. And I had such a good childhood and a very loving home, but I went through a very dark time in, uh, in the beginning of 1972. And as we led up to the summer... Uh, as we were getting to June to the time the school would be out, I was in a real, I had a real issue in my life. And my best friend asked me if I wanted to go to a camp. Now, he didn't tell me. He, he just told me that we would be playing basketball, baseball, and swimming. And, of, of course, at that time, I was a, I was a basketball player and about to enter my senior year, and I was a uh, I was a tremendous bowler, and had bowled from the time I was six years old. So I wanted to go. I needed to get away. It was a, it was the best time for me to take a week and go. But look, when I went, I knew that I was leaving um, a very tough situation, and I would be coming back and facing it when I got home. Needless to say. I got on the van with all these teenagers, and I only knew my best friend. And we go all the way from uh, Charleston, West Virginia, to Danville, Virginia. A long, a long ride. 
we get up there, put our stuff in our bunks, and uh, next thing I know, my friend was telling me we had to change clothes because there was a service uh, probably at 7 o'clock, let's say. <laughs> I said a service. So, <laughs> so anyway, I was just about to be introduced to an Assembly of God youth camp. And, uh, boy, would that be uh, an awakening. So we go to this first night of this youth camp. There's hundreds of teenagers there, and I'm in, it looked to be like I'm in an older group. I'm, I'm probably one of the few, uh, I would be 17 years old in five days. And this would be June the 18th, 1972. A young man who they called an evangelist came out and, and began to speak after they had done some music, and he talked about Jesus and about his life and how he uh, died on the cross for us and that he would save us and that our sins would be forgiven and that we would have this new life. And I'm telling you, when they gave that altar call, I'm pretty sure I ran my friends over uh, to get up to that uh, altar, kind of a man-made altar there in that old building. It seemed like I was at that altar for hours. But uh, I accepted the Lord that night. Uh, That's when I got saved that night. And... (laughs) When I got home, I wondered, what on earth is my mother going to think? I wasn't worried about my dad at all. But when I got home, they could immediately tell that something was different about me. And I explained what happened. And my mother and maybe my dad together, I don't know, went out. And the next thing I knew, they had uh, come home with a living Bible for me. And then I began to read about Jesus I immediately went to the church that took me. It was the Charleston Assembly of God Church, and it was a tremendous time of my life. I know it's a long story, but I can't tell it without telling you uh, what an amazing experience that was, and that's been now uh, 45 years. Wow, 45 years. (laughs) Praise the Lord. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that is oh, a great story. <laughs> that is a great story. I, I th- it sounds like your friend kind of knew just what, just how to phrase that invitation to the camp, knowing that you were into sports, huh? Well, I have a feeling. <laughs> you know, now that I know all there is to know, or a little bit to know about how people felt about Catholics, because I, I didn't know there was anything any different from one church to another. Our little hometown was full of churches. So I never thought much about it, but I am sure his dad and or mother had told him, oh, Gary, you know, uh, Chuck's mother will never let him go to something like this. <laughs> so I'm, I'm sure he he baited me for that, but thank the Lord that he did uh, what he did. I thank the, I thank the Lord for him. Uh, and it reminds me of every simple invitation that we give our friends along the way uh, for a special event or an invitation to a revival service or an invitation to a men's ministry night or something. Uh, It's just really stayed with me all of my life about how important an invitation is to another person. That's great. Now, I don't think it'd be possible to to share your story without talking just a little bit about bowling. So I know bowling's been a big part of your life. Can you just tell us, maybe especially for those of us, for those uh, who are listening who who are into bowling, um, how did you get into bowling and kind of how has it been a part of your life? Well, I grew up in a small town called St. Albans, West Virginia. And in, in that valley, they called the Canola Valley, there were already uh, four bowling centers, and in 1961, when I was six years old, they opened a new place, and that was in St. Albans. It was about six or seven-minute drive for us, 
And then the year after that, across the river, maybe five or six minute drive, they opened up uh, the final bowling center. We had six bowling centers within about a uh, 15 or 20 minute drive. And my parents, who were avid league bowlers, and look, David, back in that those years, let's say the, the late 50s and 60s, there wasn't a whole lot to do outside of maybe uh, the American Legion or maybe the JCs. And then bowling came along, and it was huge, 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 up, especially up north uh, and across those areas. So I started bowling when I was six and loved it. I could not get enough of it. And then I started in youth league when I was old enough to do that, probably seven or eight. And I bowled every year uh, up until my first year of college, 1975. And I won local, regional, state, and even national events during those years and was the uh, collegiate bowler of the year in 1975 for the Eastern Division. I just loved it so much that the uh, man who managed the bowling center asked me if I wanted to work there in my first year of college. <clears throat> and so I began to work there, and I made a career of it. After about a year, the owner, the owner who owned uh, two bowling centers flew into town and offered me a promotional position and gave me a little office with a phone, a desk, and a file cabinet. And uh, and I was knee deep into the bowling business, and I stayed, and that now has been 1974. That's 43. This is my 43rd year in the bowling business. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, now I got to I got to know you, Chuck, through one of your ministries, and I know that part. I mean, when I think of you, Chuck, I just think of a man who's it's hard to even keep up with all the different ways that you've, you know, served the Lord and ministries you're involved in. But if I could sum it up just from what I know about you, most of them are centered around men's ministry. And I wanted us to focus on two ministries in particular. And the first one is the Randolph Christian Men's Ministry. Can you tell us how that started and just, just kind of give us a rundown of, of what what that ministry has, has meant and what it's been involved in? Well, um, you can't always talk about everything that's good because all of us have um, things that we have to handle that are not so good along the way. So let me just say that at the beginning of 2004, uh, I owned six bowling centers and due to a situation that was beyond uh, our control, I lost all of those businesses within about a six-month period. And and I was in a, my wife was in a dark place, and I, only because operating those six bowling centers, I kept managing the bowling center where I was for the uh, were the team of men who owned that. They were a uh, team of about eight or nine businessmen that didn't know anything about bowling. So I kept managing that. So when I lost these other businesses, I woke up the next morning and went to work. And I, I kind of fought my way through that first part of 2004, and a couple uh, sponsored me to something called the Emmaus Walk, and I did not want to go. I was, uh, I, I wouldn't say I was depressed, but I really was. Uh, I just didn't want to be around a whole lot of people. And I went because Cindy had arranged this through a lady that she knew. I, had, I did not know who these people were that were coming to pick me up and take me to this Emmaus Walk. But this Emmaus Walk was one of the most fantastic weekends of my life and it was an all-men's event. Now, the women would go the next weekend, but it was all men. And when I came back from that, uh, I kind of had a resurgence in my spirit and about my future, and I began to pray, you know, here I am. 
I've been so busy with all these businesses trying to set up a future for my two children, and I thought I just had always seen something that wasn't going to be there. And now I, I went back to managing this, this one bowling center, and my life seemed almost empty. And at some point, I just I felt the Lord, you know, several times in my life, you've heard people say, I felt the Lord deal with me. Well, he was dealing with me, and it was about men's ministry. And so I sent out a, uh invitation to a lot of men from just different churches, and I invited them out to a lake. It was a place, Block Lake, Saturday morning in the fall, I believe, of 2004, and about 60-some men showed, and I was so excited because I was going to take their names back, and I was going to begin a men's ministry of some kind. When I got back to work, brother, that was a Saturday morning. I got back home, went to church on Sunday, went back to work on Monday, and Monday afternoon around 3 o'clock, my uh, 38 or 39-year-old manager was having chest pains, and we rushed him across the street to an urgent care, and they took him on to the hospital. He had a heart attack and was out for five or six months. So that next morning, I went to work 14-hour days, and I did not get to start that men's ministry. That was the fall and going into the winter of 2004, and I made a job change in the fall and winter of 2005 and went to work for a friend of mine that owned two bowling centers who had been a friend of mine for many years, and I would be driving now an hour every day, back and forth, an hour each way to work, and my van just became a, uh, a prayer van. And uh, through this time, I was asking the Lord about men's ministry and, and what I do. And, and in the early part of 2008, David, it took three years, but uh, I sat down with two friends, two of my best friends, and I explained to them what I wanted to do and one of them said, well, that is great. And the other one said, well, I don't know if you can get uh, men from other denominations together. And I don't know if that will. And so I just uh, sent another alert out to several other men. And a couple of weeks later, had six men at a table. And from those six men, I asked them to invite their pastors. And then I had a, another meeting a month later and had about 20 men and several were pastors, and uh, before I knew it, uh, we had Randolph Christian men, and uh, I just I put together a leadership team of men who would be like-minded, and, and brother, our first three years, you know, we actually, we worked all year to set up one major event, and then after three years, we decided to go into what we now call our night out and have a monthly event and it's it's been tremendous we're, i think we're still evolving and we're not where we want to be but it sure has been a uh, tremendous ministry and not because i have anything to do with it but just because of what it has done for me and and some of the men who are around me that i can see how god has worked in their lives Yeah, it has been awesome when I've really benefited from it. Um, do you have any, I mean, maybe particular stories about individual men? Or, I mean, I know there's so many things that have happened as a part of this. Maybe, maybe just some advice for others who would be wanting to do something like this. Well, of course, uh, about 4 o'clock or 4.30 one morning, now this has been... Um, this has had to have been five or six years ago. And I I was awakened, I believe. The Lord awakened me, and I drove to the bowling center very early and just walked the parking lot and began praying uh, over this ministry. And I kind of felt like 
we, you know, the Lord was telling me, you need to take this to every county in North Carolina. <laughs> so anyway, by the time I had been in that parking lot walking and praying, uh, I got inside and went to work. And I, uh, as I drove home that evening, I just I asked the Lord, Lord, you know, that's, that is a big deal. And I'm not going to make any moves myself until he sends the people my way. And so every now and then, David, there'll be a man that'll say something to me from another county, but it never has had a real springboard. We, we, uh, we did have a man at that time over in Forsyth County, and he wanted to get it started, and I went over and held a breakfast and uh, had a room full of men. But for whatever reason, this young man couldn't, they just couldn't seem to get it off the ground. And I don't know that I did any, I don't know if, if I made any mistakes with that. All I can say is that every county should have a men's ministry because it, it has brought men from all denominations together in Randolph County. I have personally met, uh, I have a list of 70 pastors that I can call right now and say hello to. This is Chuck. Just wanted to ask you a question. Uh, that, and probably 55 churches who have hosted our men's night out over these years because our goal is to go to a different church every month uh, so that these men will see that we are not totally Baptist or Methodist or Catholic or or um, uh, Wesleyan or Quaker or or whatever Pentecostal that we're we're all uh, we are the church and we're one big church and so gosh I don't even know I could talk about it forever but I've seen several men step up. I've seen their life change, and and their wives have told me, you know, you know how how uh, how brazen they are now, or how how their faith was lifted, or they see them being a, a better father with their children, or they're doing more at their own church and things like that. So it kind of makes me feel good when I think about uh, those kind of stories. Well, I'm, I'll just throw in a few of my own. I, I can't tell you how many times I've come to one of your events, Chuck, where I really needed uh, needed to be inspired, and I always was. Every time, every time I went, either because of the speaker or because of the other men. And I agree that bringing the different denominations together is so important. So I think any organization that can bring the body of Christ together, like like your events does or do is important. And I also like the way that you've partnered with organizations, whether it be, yes. you know, the local, the local shelter or the, the local government yes. officials like the sheriff and other politicians. I really, I really, you want to talk just a little bit about working with those organizations? Well, yeah, that's a, that's another, uh, when I call it the Holy spirit thing and I believe I had to, I came to a point in my life, Dave, when, you know, you would kind of set these personal goals on the kind of Christian you wanted to be. And I wanted to be a better husband. I wanted to be a better father. I wanted to support my pastor better. I wanted to do better on the job and be a better boss to the employees or to my coworkers and this sort of thing. But I condensed everything down just a few years ago to, I, I want to live like Christ. I knew if I could live like him, I wouldn't have to worry about anything else. So the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit is at work in your life, they are just he just seems to bring the people you need around you, of course, at the right time for the right reason. And what I did was uh, I called... I called the leaders of Christian ministries together several years ago on a Saturday morning. 
and I set up a fellowship hall that you're familiar with, and I allowed those leaders of all those ministries to come and introduce themselves and take 10 minutes and talk about their ministry, and I had them all in the same room. And when I made my notes and kept their names, probably it took a couple of years for it to dawn on me that, look, um, our offerings can go to bless these other ministries in our county. And so I can't name them all off the top of my head. Our daily bread, which is the soup kitchen, uh, and they feed about 80 people a day over there, lunch, people who are starving and hungry. And and so we, we did a December thing for them, and our men gave $1,600, and they pulled up a food truck and and got food out of there and stocked their shelves probably for a month, I would think. Then there was the the uh, pregnancy center, and now it's called Your Choice is Randolph. All those teenage boys and men whose girlfriends or wives were inside dealing with their pregnancy, they'd sit out in the car, some of them probably afraid to even go in there, some that may not have wanted to go in there. And what we did was raise, uh, I, I think, about $1,500, and they took that in the pregnancy center turned them into $10 gift cards for gasoline for men so that they would come back each week and attend a class on fathering this child and helping the mother and, and setting goals for their future. The, the homeless shelter for the men, they, they have about 32 beds. Those people do an awesome work, and that's not easy work at all. So we raised money for them, and we raised money for the Gideons. And we and and food and lots of food and more food for the Christian United Outreach Center every year with our summer uh, men's breakfast, having men bring food in, and we we stack truck loads of food to take to them. And I'm going to miss some others, but that itself is a blessing to be able to be part of any of that. And see, that's that is. Uh, you know, we don't have to take off and go to China to uh, help those who are in need. The need is right around the corner from us. It, in fact, it's staring us right in the face next door. Our neighbors are across the street. So I'm, I'm so pleased that our men have a heart for our community, Dave. And that's just one of the, I think that's one of the benefits of having this type of ministry where we travel all across Randolph County and we're able to reach and help different ministries. Well, thanks for going through that. I think that does give everyone a little bit better picture of what, you know, what this ministry encompasses. And I know we could go on and on about Randolph um, Christian Men's Ministry, but I want to make a transition here and talk about another ministry that you've been involved in, I guess a little more recently, although it's been a pretty good while now, and that's the, the prison ministry. Talk to, oh, yeah. talk to us, yeah, talk to us about how you got involved in that and, you know, what, what that's meant to you and, and just some details around that. Well, uh, it's probably been about six, seven, eight years ago. My wife uh, traveled the United States, and she worked with um, uh, Prison Fellowship International. It was Chuck Colson's prison ministry. And my wife, it had to have been uh, the greatest job she ever had. And she would go into prisons all across America, set up special events for the inmates, take in a crew of, you could call them celebrities if you want to, singers, uh, sports uh, athletes, uh, motivational speakers, and they would have a three- or four-hour event and they would go, they might spend two weeks in Texas and go to seven or eight prisons. But she would come back home and tell me about these events. And, of course, I listened to her, and I thought, that is that is such an amazing work that a man who had been right beside President Nixon had been put in prison because of Watergate, goes to prison probably in his 50s or maybe 60 years of age, and has the Lord tell him what he wants him to do when he's released and comes out and sets up such an awesome worldwide evangelism 
for men and women who are incarcerated. So now, speed ahead a couple years, I'm in uh, this wonderful men's Sunday school class. I think it's the, the greatest class I, I was ever in. I love these men. There's about 18 to 20 of us. And I noticed since I sat at the door, I was the secretary of the class, and I would check, I would check the attendance, take the offering, blah, 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 do this little thing. But there came a time that two or three men were bringing a man with them. And every now and then, they would be wearing green. <laughs> so one Sunday morning, when I was there by myself, and two of the men were there by themselves, I asked them, who is it that you all bring here on Sunday morning? And these two men began to tell me, so well, we've already been at church. We were at the prison at 8 o'clock, and we have a one-hour service before we get here at 9.30. And, uh, and, and we're allowed, after a little training, we're allowed to bring an inmate with us. That's who you see us bringing. So I asked them, you know, I just asked them, well, can I come some Sunday? And they said, come next Sunday morning, blah, 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 what time? We'll check you in. You don't have to bring anything. You don't have to do anything. And uh, the next Sunday morning, hey, listen, all it did was have me get up maybe a half hour earlier. So I wasn't losing anything on this. And I went to the prison, and my goodness, uh, my uh, soul and heart just bounced for joy. First of all, it was a tremendous one-hour service. The, the inmates had their own band a tremendous band, and praise and worship did a few songs, and then uh, the man named Bill did a, about a 25-minute message and an altar call, and I thought, wow, every Sunday morning this goes on. So I, I in, my, in my van, I began praying, Lord. I said, Lord, I have driven right by this prison every Sunday now for three years, picking up this couple for church. I had driven, picked up this couple, elderly couple who didn't drive, and I had taken them to church for several years, right by the prison. I looked up on the hill and saw the gates, and I would see men standing out there. And, and um, so there I was asking the Lord, Lord, what would you, uh, what would you have me do? Or is there anything to do? Or am I already, do I have enough to do? Or, are you satisfied with who I, I just went through that whole thing like I'm talking to you and and um before long of course I went home to tell Cindy about this and Cindy said, Oh my gosh, I loved that time and she started coming with me. And we began praying together and talking together about, you know, it's wonderful to be there at the prison with these men for an hour. But what happens to them when they get out? And we began to find out that uh, the the deck is stacked against them when they get out. They give them forty dollars and give them a ride somewhere uh, to a, a courthouse steps if they don't have anywhere to go, and that's it. No job, no money, no transportation. In some instances, no family, no support. And so Cindy and I began calling, uh, at, I began inviting other people <laughs> from different churches on Sunday morning, and we would write them in, and right now, we have a prison ministry team of about 40 people. And they probably uh, extend to 15 or 16 different churches with three pastors on that team. Oh my, uh, I can't even begin to tell you what it has done for us, David, I don't have enough time. Our basement has turned into a warehouse of furniture and furnishings, uh, first for the homeless and then now for the inmates who are getting out of prison. And we're finding that many of these men want to stay here in Ashborough and start a new life and be around those that love them and have treated them well. So we help find a place for them to live. We, we just keep asking people for couches and chairs and tables and lamps and beds and and this that and the other and um i could just think about what our lord said about 
taking care of and visiting the poor and and loving our neighbor and visiting those in prison. And uh, we have 60, I think it's 62 men who have been released from prison in the four years that I've been part of this ministry. And we try to keep up with them, keep in contact with them, make sure they're doing okay, because the percentage of men who return to prison here in North Carolina, unfortunately, is 86%. At least that's what it was three years ago or so when, when I learned of this. And so right now, out of the 62 men, uh, I believe there's, there's only one man that I know of that has returned to prison now. That doesn't mean some aren't struggling. But uh, two weeks from now, on Saturday, November 11th, Cindy and I will hold our reunion. We call them Freedom Brothers. Once they're released, they're a Freedom Brother. We have a big reunion, and we invite these men to come back and see us and see our team. And then we, those of us who are what we are called, we can, we can take men uh, out of the prison and have them out for six hours. We'll have some of those men from the prison who have earned that right. They'll be there. Our ministry team and our friends will be there. We'll have a big covered dish luncheon and a service at noon that day, and we will celebrate with these men their life and their future, pray over them, and it's tremendous. I I don't know what else to tell you. Um, God plugged a big hole in my life when I went to that prison that Sunday morning. I didn't realize I had an empty spot, but uh, it's been awesome. Well, whenever I talk to you, Chuck, I I, I kind of go through two emotions. Um, one is oh, I, I'm totally inspired and excited and encouraged, and and then almost a conflicting emotion is I'm I'm kind of like overwhelmed by all the things that you're involved in and. And and I don't know if anyone listening to this might be thinking the same thing, but I mean I get a sense when I talk to you, Chuck, that that even though you're involved in so many different things, that these things don't take your energy away from you; they actually fuel you. So I mean, what Amen. would you what, absolutely? What, what would you say to someone who says, "How do you how do you get motivated, or how are you driven to get involved in so many different ministries?" Um. I am, I guess the word is blessed to uh, have a sense of teamwork or teammanship in my life. I so enjoy setting teams of people up um, for a common goal and to reach certain goals in the future. So I have never tried to do anything. In fact, if I tried to do anything on my own, I would be in desperate trouble. First of all, that's the reason why I accepted Christ. I was just no good on my own, David. So, so I love getting these groups of people together. It's a, uh, it is so much fun to meet so many people who have uh, a like mind or a like heart for the homeless, or for the uh, men in prison, uh, or for men's ministry, or whatever it is that we're working on. So, I don't look. You, you know me well enough to know um, my physical limitations, but I don't let it get me down. And if I find myself on a day, if I have a day, which won't happen very often, where I feel overwhelmed, I'm, I'm back to prayer. Lord, you've got to send me someone else. Evidently, I've missed something. Uh, you, there's someone out here you've got to send me. And it seems like we're always able to do what we need to do because we have a team of people. It's, that is as exciting, maybe, as it is to, uh, to do the actual work of ministry is having that team of people because there are so many blessings that come along with those of us who, who are together now and then. Our lives are enriched, and, and we get blessed by the inmates. We get blessed by the homeless. Um, we get blessed by the men in Randolph Christian Men's, by the pastors, by all the people that we're networking with 
I'm fellowshipping with, so I don't ever, you know, every now and then I'm sure people probably think, well, you know, maybe that is too much. Are you doing too much or, you know, are you blah, blah, blah. Look, I'm I'm in a real good place, and you could ask my wife, and she would say, yeah, he's doing what he needs to do, and um, and Cindy and I are there together to hold each other up. Uh, that that right there, David, is, you know, that right there, the good marriage, the strong marriage, that probably has helped me outside of being saved and a follower of Jesus Christ. That good marriage has made all the difference in the world to what I'm able to do and what I enjoy doing. All right, good answer, good answer. And I and I know it's true. I know you. I know you and and uh, and Cindy and uh, and it, all those things you just said are, are helpful. Helpful uh, to give us a better sense of um, you know your your journey through all this. All right, I want to make a shift to some questions specifically about work. Try I try to always talk specifically about the workplace in our interviews. And so my first question for you is. How important do you think is it to do uh, your job well when you're when you're at work? Well, uh, my mother and dad had a very strong work ethic. So before my salvation, in those early years, I saw uh, parents who, who worked hard. Period, uh, and they were loving people and hard workers. So I kind of. My sister and I, we grew up seeing that example in front of us. But um, I would guess that most of us, in fact, if we're a follower of Christ and we don't want to do well, we have a real issue. And, however, uh, I think I, on the most part, I haven't always been 100%. But I bounce up in the morning looking forward to my day. I've already already have my to-do list ready for every day and know pretty much where I'm going to go unless I get interrupted. Uh, Jesus gave everything he had for me and you and all of us. Every drop of blood he shed for us, he gave it all. And so if I ever get into a mindset where I think I might be sloughing off just a little, I'll, I just go back to the cross. When I go back to the cross and think of everything he did, I just give a little more. It's a, it's an inspiration. It's an inspiration to know what he did for me. So I, I've always wanted to do a good job. I would, in, in fact, I've always wanted to do an excellent job. And, and I know I've missed it now and then. But think about what happens when you do. When you and I do an excellent job, the people around us feed off of that. And that's the way companies are built, and that's how companies become strong. That's how churches become strong. That's how families become strong, is when the people set their mind to do excellent work together, and people feed off that. So that's it, man. That's, that's every day. Christian, a Christian should want to go in and do the very best they can every day of their lives at the workplace. Amen. All right. My next question is, how do you find opportunities to love God and love others, which we know those are very important, but specifically, how do you find opportunities to do both of those things while you're at work during the day? Uh, Several things. The, because of prayer, and the time that I have in my van has become, like I said, a, a van of prayer. I get, uh, I, I'm kind of ready. I feel like I'm ready for the things that are going to come my way that I don't see coming my way. So, as an example, I, I created a, a bowling pass promotion where we might print 50 to 100,000 passes and go business to business, I'm, I'm saying door to door through two or three counties with these, and I have someone in my van with me 
who's doing the running door to door with these passes. All right, the Lord has given me opportunities to spend time with all of those people one on one, and it it didn't take long for me to realize how uh, God had set me up to either waste a lot, waste the time of those people with chit chat, or spending some time and trying to uh, help them through the time that they are going through. Every one of the people, every one of them, at some point, lets me know what is going on in their life, and I don't ever have to ask them. The Holy Spirit is at work, and I can say that in maybe, uh, maybe three people that I can think of right off the bat, I believe they are maybe living their Christian life strong right now, because of the time that we had together uh, in the van, talking, praying, uh, just giving a little scripture when when they were down and out and had something going on. I believe that one lady's marriage is together today because of the prayers that we prayed over her husband. And so that's just away from the workplace. At the workplace, the Holy Spirit just... Uh, he just seems to let me know when someone's suffering, when someone's not doing well, and we may end up in an office, and I'm, I'm going to pray with them and let them know that I'm there for them. And it's happened many times. And, again, I may not be 100%, but this is an ongoing thing in the workplace. Most everyone that I work with, I hate to even say this, over these 40-some years, I'm not sure I could I could name a dozen of these people who were church attenders, faithful church attenders. So I have had a wide open uh, evangelism base, if you want to call it that. And there were times that I didn't do well with it, David. And now at, at this point of my life, during these fruitful years, I have really uh, tried to take advantage of that time uh, with coworkers. And now and then, customers. Yeah, do you, do you think a little bit differently about your coworkers versus customers? I mean, in terms of um, how you deal with them in this area? Yeah. Um, I, I'm telling you, um, the Holy Spirit sometimes is so strong that I can simply sit down with a customer out at a table, and before long, uh, she is telling me about an adoption process that she's going through, and and I will uh, sit there with her and and pray with her, and so the I'm with look I'm with the customers infrequently I'm with the staff every day, and there is a big difference, and and look. <laughs> Don't we know that the people that we know the best, that we're around the most, drive us the craziest because we know more about them and they know more about us. As a Christian, if we're not living our Christian life in a strong way, then that means that we've let our guard down and the people that work with us are not seeing us as the Lord wants them to see us. So I would say that there is a big difference between staffers and customers, but the Holy Spirit uh, is always and will always be willing to lead someone your way, and he does. <laughs> All right. I, I like to ask, um, you know, for ideas on how to leverage your commute to and from work. A lot of times it's centered around, you know, listening to certain things on CD or podcasting, but you've already commented about how you're using your commute time, and I know you've got a pretty long commute like I do, that yeah. you're using yours um, for prayer. Do you want to just expand on that a little bit? Changed my life forever, prayer. Um, and it's a, it's a nice conversation with the Lord daily. And look, in between, I get a lot of phone calls. Also, it also gives me some time to talk with, you know, men on my ministry team or on our prison ministry team or, or, or whatever. So 
But a lot of that time is spent in prayer. Unbelievable how we hear so much about prayer all of our lives. And pastors preach on it and evangelists talk about it. And they got got 100,000 books on why pray and when to pray, how to pray, where to pray. <laughs> but you know what? When you get right down to it, when you begin having earnest prayer with the Lord, things change your life. I'm telling you, it's, it was the greatest change I can see in me was just beginning to pray daily and fervently and not just, hey, hey God, uh, my legs hurt and help me. You know, I'm, I'm talking about, hey, Lord, so-and-so is not well and we need a healing there. Or that marriage between so-and-so, they need a real healing. And, Lord, bring people around them, surround them with people who know you and love you that can help them. And I began to pray for things that are real. And instead of just talking about finances or my hurt knee or going to the doctor next week or whatever. (laughs) Amen. I agree with that. Um, Well, let's wrap things up, Chuck. If, if anyone who's listened to this would like to reach out to you and talk to you about this, about anything they've heard today, how would they go about doing that? Well, my, my cell phone, which I have with me, you know, at all times, is, is 704-213-0962. If, if they want to email me, it's Poochie, P-O-O-C-H-I-E, 62355 at yahoo.com, and then I'm on Facebook, Chuck Powers, Ashboro, North Carolina. And if they want to scream real loud, I'll try to hear them. <laughs> <laughs> Chuck, can you repeat the email? I think you cut out for a second on the email. Oh, can you it? repeat the email? All right. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's Poochie, P-O-O-C-H-I-E, 62355 at yahoo.com. And maybe if someone uh, reaches out to you, they can ask you uh, what, what that poochie is all about. But that's we'll save that for another <laughs> another another day, right? Yeah, right. that's about it. Yes. <laughs> yes, sir, David. Thank you. I sure love you, brother. I miss you all so much. All Thanks. right, love you too, and thanks for your time. Have a great day. You too. See you. All Bye-bye. right. Bye. All right, that'll wrap it up for this episode, and. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Chuck as much as I did, and and I hope it, it gives you a sense of uh, that uh, there's going to be some great uh, discussions on this podcast ahead. I'm really excited about it and excited about spending this time with you moving forward. A quick reminder to call in to our new prayer line if you want to make a prayer request or make a comment about what you heard today. The number is 641-715-3900, extension 524-645-POUND. Once again, that's 641-715-3900, extension 524-645-POUND. And uh, so have a great day and we'll see you next time.